Welcome to a tutorial video on Twine 2.0. So in this video, I'm going to cover user input in SugarCube. Now, SugarCube is actually one of three different story formats that come with Twine 2.0. So to change story formats, you click on the title of your story, and you get a couple of diff a few different options here. You can edit the story JavaScript, edit the story style sheet, and as you see here, the third option, change the story format. So when you click on that, you get three different options. You can choose Harlow, you can choose Snowman, or you can choose Sugarcube, which I've already done here. Now note, as it says underneath Harlow, it's the default story format. So when you first start a story in Twine 2.0, it is Harlow is already chosen for you. So if you want to change it, you have to bring up this menu and choose either Snowman or Sugarcube, or just leave it at Harlow. So this, for example, for this example, I've already changed it to SugarCube. And I will click play. So as you can tell, the format of the story is different. But not only is it visually different, the mechanics, the, the code behind it is different as well. And this goes with both SugarCube and Snowman and Harlow. Each one has a different way of approaching JavaScript and TwineScript and what can be styled with CSS. So something to do if you've never seen these is experiment in each story format and find one that matches your needs and how you like to create projects. So again, most of the time when we're talking about Twine 2.0, we usually mean the Harlow story format. It's the default, it's what people usually use. However, again, like I showed, there are two other formats. We could use Snowman and we could use Sugarcube. So in this tutorial, I'm going to go over a few different ways to get players to supply some input. We're going to talk about clicks, we're going to talk about buttons, text boxes, and text areas. So let's talk about user input. So unlike in Harlow, which again is the default, SugarCube is a port of the syntax and the functionality of earlier versions of Twine. So instead of using the parenthetical approach, it uses the older two less than signs and two greater than signs around some macro name as a way to reference the macros. So for example, if we wanted to use the common assignment macro set, we would use something like the following. Two less than signs, the macro name, and then what, it, what we want it to do. So in this case, we want to set the variable to the value a nice sharp cheddar. Now, in all of these exam code examples within this tutorial, I've actually created a space between the less than signs and the greater than signs and the macro name I'm using. If you want to actually use the macro within Twine, remove these spaces in your own code. And then it will be run exactly as you have it written. So for example, I set the variable to a nice sharp cheddar. And then I displayed it right here, a nice sharp cheddar. This is the display, the printing of the value of the variable. So note, Unlike in Harlow, we have to use the print macro to display the value of some variable. The reason for this is that Harlow interprets variables in runtime. That is, we could have just stuck this right here, the, va the variable cheese with its dollar sign within the passage, and Harlow would interpret that as its value and printed it for us. Sugarcube doesn't do that. So it's something to keep in mind that if you want to ever display some value of a variable, you have to use the print macro. Okay, so let's talk about the click user input here. So within SugarCube, click works in a similar way that link does in Harlow. So link in Harlow, if you're not familiar, is a way to create a link. Now that's a straightforward name. And then to do something when the user clicks on that link either to change some text or to run some other macros, to basically to do anything you want to. So click in SugarCube works in a similar way, but the main difference between click in SugarCube and link in Harlow is that click in SugarCube does not automatically swap the text. So for example, when you use link in Harlow, you click on some link, and then if you have any text within its associated hook, it replaces that text with the link. So it swaps the content. Click doesn't work that way. Click looks like this. 
We have an opening click and a closing click invocation. And then we have to put something in there for click to do. It won't automatically swap text, but you can instead put other macros in there to do something. So again, click within Sugarcube works in a similar way that Link does within Harlow. So it allows us to create some hyperlink, something for the user to click on, but does not necessarily lead to another passage. So we can do something when the user clicks on stuff. It works pretty similar in a way that we pair sensor changer macros in Harlow though. In that we can pair a click action with the replace macro and replace some text when the user clicks on a link. Similar to the default functionality of a link within Harlow. Okay? So the other thing to remember is that hooks don't exist in Sugarcube. They only exist within Harlow. So within Harlow, a hook is some opening bracket, some text, or some commands, and then a closing bracket. And then macros in Harlow act on hooks to do different things, to change things, to change colors, to swap different content, things like that. But hooks don't exist within Sugarcube. So how does Sugarcube act on things? Well, it acts on the elements of some element, or the IDs of some element, that is. So in our example here, I've got an element span wrapped around some other macros, these things. I've also set its ID to message because, again, macros within Sugarcube act on the ID of some element. So I've got a span element and it's got an ID message. And then within this, I've got a click macro. So a click macro starts with the word click and then something in quotations to be the link for someone to click on. It has some action within it, something to do, and then it closes with a slash click. So in this full example, within the span message, we have the click macro. Within the click macro, we have the replace macro working on the ID message, which is this whole span. And so when it is invoked, it replaces whatever is within the element containing that ID with some other material, some other content. <clears throat> In this example, we're using the print macro to print the string a message. So when we click on the link of this quotation, whatever's in the quotation, click this to see a message, we're replacing the content of the element with the ID message with this string a message. So to see this in action, I have this link right here. Click this to see a message, and we click on it, and we see a message. <laughs> Very straightforward. So if we want to replicate the way link works in Harlow, we've got to be a little creative with it within Sugarcube. And we have to combine both the click macro for user to click on something, and the replace macro to replace some content matching the ID of some element. It's a little more complicated, I know, but this works through the older syntax of the way Twine used to work and the older story formats of using different invocations of macros using the less than and greater than signs instead of the hook system that Harlow uses. Okay, so we've gone over click in that it starts with opening click, some thing to click on, some action to take, and then a closing click macro. What if we didn't want a link though? What if we wanted a button? Ah, but we can do that in Sugarcube as well. So it has a button macro that works similar to the way click does in that we have an opening button invocation, you have something in quotations to put on the button, you have some action to take. Again, we're using the replace macro, similar how we did in the click macro example in the previous passage. We close the button macro, and then within the example, we close this entire element. <clears throat> so if we wanted to replicate the example I just showed in click, I can do that by just changing the word click to the word button. And thus, we have a button. Click this to see a message. We click on it. 
and we replace that content. Okay, so we can click on link, we can click on buttons, that's all cool. What if we wanted to use it to input something? Some type of data, maybe their name, some statistics, something like that. Well, we have two options for that within SugarCube. We can use a text box, or we can use a text area. So let's talk about text box for a second. So it is the most common form. Text box works on two different parameters. So the first is the variable to save whatever is entered, and the second is the default value to set that text box. So we have an example right here. So we have a text box, name of the macro, in quotations, we have the name of the variable, and then in quotations, we have the name of the default content. And if you want nothing to be in there, you can just leave this blank. And then we have example right here. We have a text box that has a default value, default value of Dan, and whatever is entered, for example, if we changed it to Sam instead of Dan, it would set that value to the variable. So the name would have that value. However, if I press enter, nothing really happens. So what if we wanted the user to input something, then press enter, and then go to some other passage? Well, we can do that with text box, and it just needs a third parameter. So again, we start with the text box, the name of the macro, in quotations, the name of the variable we want to save the data, in quotations, the default content, and then in quotations, the name of the passage to then be forwarded to, which is a term within SugarCube. Within different things, you get forwarded to different passages, which basically means that due to some action, the user is then sent to some other passage. So an example here, we have a text box. Its value will be set to this variable. We have a default content of Fred. And then when we press enter, after we've typed something, will be sent to the passage show name. Now before I press enter here, I want to make another note that the forwarding passage must exist. You have to create it. Within the Twine editor, it will not check this for you. So make sure you've created that passage or an error will occur and your story will stop. <laughs> so let's type something here. So the default content was Fred. What if I want to change it to Sam? Uh, how about George? We'll set it to George. And now I'm going to press enter. And we'll set it to another passage. So, hi, we're here via a text box. Very exciting. And the current value of the variable name is George. And again, as a reminder, SugarCube doesn't interpret variables within passages. Only Harlow does that. So we actually had to use the print macro right here to print the value of the variable name, which is what I've done right here. Okay, so we've looked at text box. What if we didn't want one line? What if we wanted multi-line input? Like we wanted to input an essay or a longer response or a few sentences or something like that. Doesn't look like it actually fit within a text box. So for that, we actually want to use a text area, which is the last item. So a text area is like a text box, but it allows multi-line text input, so multiple lines and it doesn't have the same forwarding functionality that text box does. So you notice when I talked about text box, it had those three parameters, right? We could have the default, we could have the variable to store the value, we have the default content, and then we have the passage to forward to when we press enter. Text area doesn't have that. So if you want something to happen after someone's entered content in text area, you need to supply something else. So we pair it with a click macro or a button macro or some other movement to another passage. So that's what I have right here. Again, we have this entire, we have a span, a span element covering this entire code. We have a text area macro. Again, in quotations, we have the variable we want to use, and in quotations, we have the default content. And then we're supplying a button, and then when clicked to do something, we're gonna replace the content of the ID output, which is this entire selection, with the print you wrote plus whatever the response was. And the response is a variable with the value of whatever we entered within the text area. 
So you can present a question like this, how do you feel about this tutorial? Pretty great, right? And I can type some stuff. Some stuff. Other words, things. And so again, whatever we typed here will become the value of the variable response. And then when we press the button submit, something will happen. It will replace the content of the ID output with this print statement. So when I click on submit, it replaced it all. It replaced the entire section with some stuff, other words, things. <laughs> Not much of an uh, input. Uh, I, I agree. So let's go look at that a little bit in practice. So this, again, as a reminder, when we actually use macros within SugarQ, we need to make sure we remove the spaces. So right here, I cover this all in a span, and there are no spaces between the less than signs and the greater than signs to use them. And then again, in text box, the last parameter is the passage to be forwarded to, which is why within the editor, you don't see a connection between text box and show name. So we moved over to show name, and then we looked at text area as the last one. And again, no spaces to set up how we're using a text area. So when you use SugarCube, you actually have a number of different user inputs. We can do clicks, we can do buttons, we can do text boxes, we can do text area. And there are actually two more I didn't cover, which are radio buttons and check boxes, which are the same as their HTML element counterparts that you can allow a user to click multiple options or one of a number of options. And I actually encourage you to, when you select the story format, to actually follow up on the documentation. SugarCube actually has very good documentation on what the different things, what the different macros do, how they can be combined together. And I actually highly recommend, if you think you may like to use SugarCube, to go look at the documentation and to definitely play with it yourself to see what user inputs you may like to use, what macro combinations may fit, whatever story needs you have. Thanks for watching.